you very much. Um, I would rather speak about finance, <laughs> not about demographics. I do not know that much about fertility. I just learned the differences between all these demographic words recently. But there is one thing uh, which I want to speak about because I'm generally optimistic about the future. We all know all these beautiful books published by some of our friends and colleagues, some of our distant relatives of the movement, like Johan Orberg, which is a good friend of us, or uh, Hans Rosling, which is a distant relative, but people who come up with the optimistic um, prophecies. But one thing strikes me, and that's that there is one pessimistic um, idea about the future, and I think it's even necessary that it will happen. So today, for the first time after many, many years, I remember some of my first lectures back then after the financial recession where we were a little bit pessimistic about the outlook of the world but right now everything seems fine except the depopulation and I will try to make a case for something Stepan mentioned the more people the better but unfortunately we are heading the other way so why I call it the population bomb is obvious, you all know that there is uh, this guy, uh, Paul Ehrlich, uh, who wrote a book, Population Bomb, in 1968, which tries to predict and coined the term, um, tries to predict what would be, what would be caused by the increase in population. Most of it is simple extrapolation, but there is even some idea behind it that we will not be able to, uh, to feed the population, all these small and ideas. You know the statements, you know that there, is, there was a whole movement, and even I remember, I don't think that I'm the dead old, I'm 35, and even I remember that uh, my, on, on, at the end of high school here in the Czech Republic, we have the, these graduations, and one of the, one of the questions in English in English literature, or I don't know how to call the, the subject, was overpopulation. So it was still common back in, I don't know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, right now, we are facing quite the opposite. Uh, if you look at the statistics, and I will have a lot of statistics here, I guess that some of you know, some of them I didn't know, and I think they are interesting. Um, almost half of the world has the fertility rate below the base reproduction number, which is the magic number 2.1, when we would keep the population stable uh, or the constant. We are roughly half of the world. I understand that we, of course, cannot calculate countries. Uh, the main argument at the end will be that no matter what the rest of the world will do, if China and India will be at the fertility rate they have now, no matter what the rest of the world will do, the population will collapse. So we see that still we increase the population a little bit in the whole world, but very, very soon, it's a matter of years, not even decades, we, even as a whole world, will fall below, fall below the 2.1, uh, below the magical number, and uh, the world will slowly start to decline. We do not know when, I will show you some estimates, but it will be sooner than we thought. By the way, in the Czech Republic, where we are now, um, it was way before some of you, most of you probably here in the room, were born, when we fell below uh, 2.1. We still grow, mostly because of migration in the Czech Republic, uh, it's a beautiful country, safe country, so people uh, migrate here, fortunately, and they still will. Depopulation started to be a thing pretty recently. Um, as I mentioned, even I remember that the fear was mostly of the open overpopulation, not the depopulation. There are still people who fear uh, overpopulation, like Paul Collins here, a very influential book, which calls for overpopulation, for depopulation, that we should, mostly for environmental reasons, uh, decrease population 
But there are also, finally, people, and this one is my favorite, and probably the, the, the biggest inspiration of the whole talk, uh, there are also people who understand that we are facing a huge problem, and that the depopulation is a bad thing, it's a problematic thing. Even though they start, they try to be alibistic, they try to say that it's... I think it's just that. Is it that? No oh, shot. <laughs> you must start. There's there's one more. I don't know if it works. Okay. I'll try to be one because I don't know about it. You can show now and then. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's a small room. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so there are people who who fear depopulation, but here I said they're elibistic, they say that there are some good things and bad things about it. But if you read the list of bad things, and many of them, and their list of good things is, it may be good for the environment. So I don't even think that it's very balanced. And overall, uh, I understand that their conclusion is, is negative. So some of, the, uh, some of the people who made it into mainstream, of course, you may like him, you may not, but Elon Musk is one of the one of the people who recently um, made it headlines that the population may be a problem, especially for him because if you want to populate Mars, then you need more people, not less people. Um, we will probably have the opposite problem of what we thought we will. So my main main conclusion here, I think it's very simple. Nothing to no, nothing complicated here. My main goal will be to convince you that maybe most, but at least a significant part of the growth, of the magical growth we experienced, especially in the second half of the 20th century, was not in spite of, but it was because of the growth of population. It was because my father in his lifetime uh, lived during the time when the population tripled. That's because of it why he experienced such a growth and the depopulation will make it much harder. I don't think that it's the end of the world. I don't want to be that pessimistic. I think that we will manage somehow, that we can do it. But it's much harder to grow without the low-hanging fruits of population. It's much easier to grow if you have one billion people in China who join the global trade than without it. If we will decrease, if the population of the world will decrease, it will be harder, we will need to grow more uh, intensively, not extensively. And the intense growth is more complicated. You need to be more creative, you need to be more productive, you need to, be, you need to study more. Those are hard things. Create babies is cheaper and easier, I guess. So, uh, some numbers. This is just a fun fact. I didn't know where to put it in the presentation, and uh, so I wanted to start with it. I didn't know about it when I looked at the numbers. There is a consensus that on the planet Earth from, I don't know when we start, we can even start to think about people as people that were more than 100 billion people uh, living throughout the history of mankind. And 7% of them are still alive. We're living in an era which is, of course, as we all know it, uh, full of people. I saw it in one YouTube video, uh, which was well resourced, who, which said that, uh, and someone shared it in a group, we have together with some of you here, that someone shared there the, the number that most of the people who lived throughout the whole history of mankind didn't live a past 20, which is uh, interesting. Now, now most of you, or all of you, I guess here, are so lucky to be alive because most of people, most of the people, would not be able to live uh, past twenty. What is the main, um, what is the, what is the mainstream idea about the growth of population in uh, the next century or this century? This is the United Nations uh, estimate of the future growth of population. The median growth here is the famous number 
11 billion that we will move or we will um, somehow, somehow get somewhere close to 11 billion and then the number of people on the planet will plateau here somewhere around 11 billion it's very uh, it's very wide you see that it can be anything between 15 and six and a half here what I would argue here, and not only me, but even the authors of the empty planet and some of the other estimates, even some very distinct, distinguished um, uh, scientists in demographics, for example, the last last paper about the, the, the outlook, future outlook of population in Lancet, in probably the most respected medic, medical journal, says that it, this definitely doesn't hold. It will be one of these two. But there are, there are all authors who argue that you can even s here you can start to see that the growth will be slower and probably we will plateau somewhere between eight and nine billions. And I would bet on that. I would bet that it will not be the 11 billions that will be somewhere between eight and nine because we already see some of the numbers. So this is probably the most um, probable growth of the world's population. We will plateau somewhere here, and they will go down. And after a few slides, there are even authors who say that this inevitably goes down to zero, and the planet will be in a century, or two, not a century, two centuries or three centuries, will be empty. There are other authors, but it's a huge futurology. We do not know what will happen in a year or two, not to say two centuries. So there are some futurologists who say, Probably there is some equilibrium that people will move back more to regions from cities, there will be urbanization, people will have more kids. So there will be some equilibrium, but we will not be able to keep it here at 8 billion, which I agree with. If you look at the, the, the most probable outcome uh, of these estimates, you see, even now you see that we have a problem. You may like it probably, but I will try to convince you that it's a problem. That this is 2017, probably I could update it, but the, the numbers changed a little bit up. Uh, China is decreasing right now a little bit. But you will see that China will lose almost a half of its population till the end of the century. So half of the population of, of the biggest country in the world today, even India will decrease a little by some 300 million. Uh, you see that even Indonesia, some of the other countries will go up, USA will go up a little bit, a little bit even because of uh, slightly higher fertility than some comparable countries have, but also because of migration, definitely it's still the the country where people most likely to migrate to and want to migrate to. So this is this is a positive outcome. But you have some countries here which are not that much known about today. I don't know how many of you know a lot about Nigeria or Democratic Republic of Congo, but they will start to be uh, start to be more and more important especially because of the high fertility they, they keep uh, today and will keep probably even uh, in the future. With my wife, we binge watched all the Star Wars movies and series uh, the past months. Um, some of them are good, some of them are terrible, but one of the things which struck me was that you see the whole galaxy is populated by people, not only people, also aliens, but mostly people, or not mostly, but you see people everywhere, but they do not have three, five, six children, all of them have one or two. It simply doesn't make sense. We will not be able to live in the future on many planets uh, if you will have the population. Definitely. That's the argument of, of Elon Musk. And and I don't understand it. If I would write sci-fi, I would try to make it um, scientific. So, 
it would have, you would have to explain in the sci-fi why people in the future, after a few thousand years, will have five to six children to populate all the galaxies. You don't see it there. Try to find a character with three or more children in, in Star Wars, like um, a human character. But even without that, you see planets. There's the planet, how is the, how's the planet called? The, the, the Corpus Gun, which has one trillion inhabitants in there, mostly people. Uh, how is that possible if you don't have uh, fertility rates of five or six? We will not have it, and you already see it. If you look at the you can look at the region we live in, you see that some of the countries will lose in few in few years. It's in 25, 27 years. They will lose quarter of the population. Latvia, Ukraine, even without the border, would lose. Uh, a lot of people, which uh, is now even worse, of course. Uh, even COVID decreased the fertility rates. Uh, you see the Balkans. There are countries where it's not true, mostly because of migration, like Ireland and Luxembourg, and even Czech Republic. If you look further in the future, again with a lot of um, uh, with a lot of in so we don't know that much about the future, but you know that Czech Republic is an exception here in the region, mostly because of migration. We already have the fertility rate below 2.1. We had it, as I told you, from 1980, but people migrated here. But people migrated here, which increases the, uh, the population here. If you look at the world, of course, nothing surprising here that the only region where the fertility rates are above the magical number are here in Africa and most mostly in the sub-Saharan Africa. And the reason why we see it, at least in literature, is we have, we have many ideas why we see it. Probably it's a combination of all of them. One of them is urbanization. Uh, the very vulgar idea of why we see the decrease in fertility rates is that uh, in a village, in a large, on a large ranch, you know, in a house you have, the more kids you have, the more labor you have. But if you move to a city, which we all do, all, all did, then more children you have, the, the more costs you have to pay. So it's quite the opposite, and it's even more expensive because of the uh, rent prices and housing prices. So the 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 rates of urbanization, which we uh, saw and will see even in the future, the trend is pretty pretty clear, will cause certain rates to decrease even more than we see today. And it's happening everywhere. That's not just Europe, it's not just Americas, it's everywhere. Somewhere the growth is smaller because you already have high urbanization rates in North America, so you don't see that much of a difference. But even in the least developed parts of the world, you see and you will see, um, based on the estimates, um, huge uh, urbanization, which leads to lower fertility rates. It's also culture. I don't know much about these arguments. Uh, I'm not a sociologist, even though I studied some sociology for five years, but I didn't understand it. As Gary Becker always said, that. Economics is easy. He was a Nobel professor of economics and sociology, and he was like, economics is easy. You can get a Nobel Prize for economics easily, but sociology is hard. So I don't know much about it, but um, we see on numbers that if you ask people what is the ideal uh, family size, what is the ideal number of children, you see that something changed. And you see that mostly this is the blue one, it's two children, and there are some countries where it's, you still have a high percentage of people who answer, it's just mothers, I think it's, it's, it's women answering, uh, who say that uh, three children is the ideal number. Ideal number doesn't mean that they will get to that number, but if you ask them at a young age, what is the ideal number of children they want to have, then you see that, especially here in this country, Czech Republic, like it's two. It's two, nothing less, plus three is strange. 
Some of us here have friends who have seven children, and we look at them a little bit strange. Uh, so uh, it's strange, but here in the Czech Republic, it's a social norm. And it's interesting that it doesn't change much. It doesn't change much that there is not a single country, there's one exception, it's, it's in Israel, uh, but other than Israel, for a little, a little while, there is not a single country which have made it from, the, from below the magical number 2.1 above. So once you have it, then uh, it seems that it starts to be a cultural norm and you, you're bound to the ideal number of children, two or less, or even zero, which is totally okay. We all like individualism and uh, we all uh, understand that people can do whatever they want. This is just constating, uh, I, just, I just wanted to uh, state the fact that this is happening and one of the reasons why we see it is a culture which some countries try to counter and for example in Denmark they started a TV ad do it for Denmark they start to convince people that it's great to have sex and have kids. So even the government in some countries try to spend money to increase fertility rates. I don't know if this would convince me, but obviously some, some people thought that it may be convincing. The other problem, which may be, some people argue that it may be even more important uh, I think that it's a combination of both, is that we have aging population, and the argument is simple. Even if you would increase the fertility rate, then with a population of old people, you would not be able to reproduce, reproduce with, within the small group of people who can reproduce the population, you would not be able to, uh, to increase the number of people overall. So, what we see, and this is not a not surprise to anyone here, I guess, we all see everywhere, even in Africa, you see and will see um, an increase in the expected, um, expected age. So, here you see it everywhere, here you see how it looks today, the, 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 it's not average, it's the median age of, of the population in, in the biggest countries. One thing which surprised me, I told you that some of the things surprised me, is that according, uh, contrary to what people usually think, China is not, a, not full of young people. Uh, the population of China is on average, or the median person here is, is older than in the United States. Slightly, uh, but it is, and it will be even worse very soon. This is why this, the, the, the extreme drop in population in China and not that much in the US, plus the migration. Not so many people want to migrate to China, more people want to migrate to the United States. Uh, but the population of China is pretty old. There is the same of one of the economists, maybe you will, uh, you will tell me who it was, I forget the name, uh, who said that China has a problem because China got older before they got rich to be, to, to be able to afford to get old, uh, which is definitely true. And probably all of the estimates about how China will be the leader of economic growth are a little bit overestimated. It will be more interesting in Nigeria, I guess. Because the average age in Nigeria is 18 right now. More than half of the population is below 15. Uh, this is the this is the estimate according to United States, which is overestimated. So uh, probably you would need to subtract from some of the number some of these numbers, but it's expected according to UN. I think that you can be 15, 20 percent below the estimate, but still Lagos probably will be the largest city in the whole world. The UN estimate is that it will be hard, uh, larger than the current population of, of Germany, which is which is a lot. Other cities which, that, 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 would, that would be interesting for me, uh, that's why I ask it. The second largest city in 2100, according to the United States, would be uh, Kinshasa, which I guess don't know where is it, but who else knows where is, where is the city? One, two, three. Which is, 
which is strange how, how Eurocentric we are here, that the, in few decades, the largest city, second largest city in the world is projected to be uh, a city most of us here in the room do not even know exists or where is it, uh, which is the Democratic Republic Congo. So uh, the second largest city will be in Congo, most probably. Maybe not that much as United Nations thought, but still the second largest. So why do we even care? Why do we care about the drops in fertility rates and the dead population? I will skip these, we don't have that much time for that, but this is usually the argument uh, we have when we, when we want to make the optimistic lecture about how everything is great. This is my father and this is how I usually try to look at the numbers, how the world looked when he was born. Um, roughly 60 years ago, and how does it look now? So you know all these arguments, you know that the world is richer and uh, people are more educated and everything is going up and down if you want to go it down. But the reason why is it so, that's, that's, that's the tough question. And I don't think that for us here in the room is that tough. We know that market works, and we know that the best thing that happened to us is something we hide under the name of globalization. It doesn't matter how you measure it. This is the simplest measure as a sum of the export and imports on the global GDP, which went up and down, went up and down. We're still somewhere here. Nothing happened that much in the past 10 years. This is why we also uh, talk about deglobalization a little bit these days. You could see here the, how the world was globalized and is today. And not only that we connected all the people to the global, uh, global trade, but there was also more people we even had in the whole world. And this is the, uh, this is, this is the number I have mentioned at the beginning. From the time my father was born till today, a, uh, the population tripled before I was born, and today the population went up by 30%, which is much, much less than what my father experienced, and it will be even less and less. This is the UN, UN estimate, so probably we will not even get here, and it will start to decrease somewhere here between 8 and 9 um, billion. The argument here is that this is a very cheap source of growth. This is long, long, low hanging fruit, as I mentioned it. This is, you can imagine the deserted island where if you want to grow, no matter how you measure it, if you want to grow the economy, the easiest way for the Robinson is to find another guy on the island or to engage in, in trade. Those are the very simple arguments you all know. So. Here, we were able to have more people in the world and engage the people in the global trade. If we will not have it, as I said, I still think we can, man we can manage, we can do it somehow, but we have some challenges to, to think about. We have to think about retirement, we have to think about pension, we have to think about how easy it was for my father's generation or uh, even for his parents' generations to, to rely on the population growth to be able to have some purchasing power uh, in their retirement. This is probably not possible to, to have uh, in the future and more than we thought. Still, you have to think about the, the United Nations estimates is probably overestimated. It will be even worse than we've expected. So, no one knows how, but we kind of understand that we will have to find a model where people even uh, in their own, in, the, in their retirements, will have to work somehow to be able to, to sustain the living standard we have. Or the living standard, the decrease of living standard between uh, or from the employment 
till the retirement would decrease dramatically. Here in the Czech Republic, I don't know how is it in other countries, but we have now roughly 50%, which means that if you earn some money on average in your job, then if you, the second day, you do not go to work and have, uh, have your retirement, you decrease your living standard uh, by 50%, which is somewhat manageable, it's one of the highest we ever had, but in the future it may be 25% or so, which may create some trouble, I will speak about it briefly. There are some well-respected uh, articles about how, uh, what reaction it will create in the monetary and fiscal policy. This is one of the, of the articles uh, which tries to explain uh, what, the re what the reaction of monetary policy will be to the population and that we will need to have more aggressive monetary policy in times when the population is decreasing. So we can expect that and I guess that here in the room uh, no one likes that. There are huge models which tries to explain how the population can damage the, the economic growth we are used to. Even the simple solo model can tell you that we have a problem when the population is decreasing. This is probably the most respected article. You can see there it is. It's, it's pretty, uh, pretty new. It's November 22. From the, economic, uh, from the American Economic Review, the, the most uh, respected uh, economic journal. So it's not, uh, this, is the, this is the mainstream. And you see here that once we have here the population grow below zero, which we'll probably have very soon, then the outcome, if we want to be able to move here to the steady state, this is a steady state which you clearly see here, is uh, is not that steady. Uh, so the only thing you will see, and you probably we all will probably see, is a steady decrease of the population until the empty planet. The article is even called the empty planet. The same as the book, different authors. But there is clearly a fear that in not not that many centuries maybe two or three centuries, the planet may be empty. I guess that some people would like it, uh, not me. There is a fear, and this is probably one of my biggest fears, of very cheap and stupid populism when you have an aging population, low fertility rates, decreasing uh, the ratio of medium wage to the medium uh, pension, then you will see politicians trying to, to get votes on the, on, on the, uh, from, from the population which is affected by that, mostly from pensioners. So here, you already see it, you already see that you cannot win any elections without the pensioners, but that's that's only the beginning of, we, of what we can see uh, in the future. I don't know what to do about that, but it's a problem, and you know it here in the Czech Republic, well, uh, even today, not to say in the future, the problem, of course, is, I had to mention it here, that when I try to put the population in, the, uh, in, in Google and everywhere, I try to look for pictures of cats and the population, I found these cats. Uh, with the tinfoil hat, which can tell you that there are a lot of, of course, conspiracy theories about the population. Even without the conspiracy theories, we will see the population, so you don't need to have Bill Gates decreasing population through vaccines or whatever the people say, uh, but still we will see the population. And it's kind of sad. I tried to Google Doom Cat, this is what, what showed up. So, I think that we have a problem. And this is the only problem I see in the future. Uh, all of the other things, and as, as I mentioned, Johann Orberg and Hans Rosling and many others, I think that everything is very optimistic. But I don't know what to do about the degrees of population. We know that we can do something about it. And this is good to know about it. 
we have to do something with the retirement. We have to change the rules. We are getting used to in times when the when the uh, when the fertility rates were high. Probably, and it would be my receipt. We still didn't. Uh, we still didn't draw upon the low hanging fruits fully. So we still can draw upon the globalization and uh, open markets more than than we had. So we still have a lot of room to, to, to use what we uh, grow from in the 20th century. So uh, I think that there would be a lot of people to agree that this may be a solution. This is why we speak about it here at Students for Liberty, uh, Liberty Evening, or find other ways to grow, the hard ones. And this is what is that, the innovation, productivity, all these silly passwords, no one even know what they mean, but we need to be more innovative, we need to be more educated, we need to be more productive. But it's that hard, it's much easier to have more people somewhere on the other end of the planet and exchange with them what you want for what they want. Or, that's the ad for Do It For Denmark. This is how they convince you to have more kids. But probably this is not happening. I look at, uh, at the numbers in Denmark and they didn't change them that much, so I don't know if the ad was successful. Uh, but you never know what would happen without it, maybe there would be even more. So uh, that's the, I will keep it here, that's the, that's, that's the last idea. Uh, I don't know if you, if you want to or can or need to have more children. But we will need to somehow manage with the situation. I don't think it will be easy. I think it's pessimistic. And you tell me what to do, how to save the world. Thank you. So, what not me, but the authors who, who thought about it, 
uh, try to um, try to speak about is that we should somehow rethink the the retirement. Somehow employ the people. We are not used to it, and it's always hard to say we need to change our minds about retirement. I don't think that it would happen. But probably, probably there is the way. If we would be able through medicine to help even the elder people to be healthy and still keep some of the jobs. I'm, I'm at a university. The average age at the university is probably 80. So it is possible in some jobs. So if we would be able to keep people healthy to work, maybe the lower detentions. You begin your, you begin your presentation um, showing the gloomy predictions of the people who are completely wrong about the explosion of population, mass hunger and starvation, um, like Paul Eric and so on. That turned out to be completely false because they just extrapolated and they assumed that there would be no technological progress. So they came to an extremely pessimistic conclusion at the time. But do you not do actually the same here? So you assume that, okay, now populate, now fertility is going down and you are just extrapolating. Mm -hmm. huh? then how, how, how can you be so sure this is going to continue? How can you be sure that this yeah. will always go on? And then you come also to, to um, extremely pessimistic conclusions, even and it seems to me also assuming there will be no technological progress, there will be no human inventiveness who might cope with the problem. I mean, we see many things now emerging like, I don't know, um, artificial intelligence, but apart from the discussed, dan discussed dangers, this should, that would be likely to lead to an explosion of wealth and economic growth, which might, might solve the problem and uh, might make children cheaper again. Um, and, and there might be many, many things, including technological progress. So are you not in danger of falling into the same pessimistic traps of the doomsday sayers uh, 50 years ago who were scared of population explosion? Uh, thank you. I hope that someone will ask about uh, the, the futurologist ideas about replacing or helping uh, with the artificial intelligence, or I don't know what, I even had uh, questions about cloning people or whatever. Uh, that's ecologic in, in, in general. So I, I agree, and as I said, I'm generally optimistic. But here, when you see that there is not a single country in many decades, uh, uh, in the, even in the Czech Republic, which is not the worst in the world, that's in Japan, it's already 43 years when below the, the magical numbers. So that's something where I would not only extrapolate a little bit, but it's already creating the problems we, uh, we probably see in the future. We solve the problems we see even today, like uh, on the pensions, for example. So uh, I understand that it's hard to, to predict these numbers, uh, but I, I don't know anyone who would, who would believe that we would somehow come up with the numbers. I've met a guy who told me that once we will be so rich that nothing will be a problem, then probably we just want to enjoy as many kids as possible, and, and it may happen. Um, I'm not sure. As an economist, I know, and as, as a father of two, I know that there is a cost, and even if I have all the freedom in the world, the, the richer I am, the, the more expensive is my free time, the, the, the higher cost the, the, ch the children have. So I don't, I don't think that this will happen. I am very techno-optimistic, so as I said, and probably I have to stress it more, I think that we will manage. But it's much harder than simply increase the population as, our, as my father and my grandfather experienced. So I think we will we'll manage, I think we will, we will handle it. I don't know how, that's, uh, that's up to the future, but it's the harder way. The intensive growth is much harder than the simple extensive growth. That, that was my argument. I'm generally optimistic. I, I don't want to say that uh, this, is, this is the end of the world. 
even though I mentioned that out of all the things which I think that are going the right, in the right direction, here I have some reservations. I can follow up a bit on this question, but push a little harder. By the way, wonderful, very provocative, very interesting presentation, so so much to think about. You put a lot of emphasis on Smithian growth. So Smith says the extent uh, that the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market, increase the extent of the market, bring China into the global economy, you increase the division of labor, increase growth. But I don't, I doubt that that accounts, that it has the driving force you attributed to it. Because if you look even at China and India, trade with them was negligible. If you go from 1945 up until uh, really mid 80s, it's, it's almost nothing very small, but economic growth, growth in personal income in Europe and uh, North America is extremely high and actually begins to level off and go down to more anemic uh, two, two and a half, three percent levels after that. So it seems to me it's innovation probably is accounting for the great bulk of that. And if we don't expect that to diminish, why should we be so gloomy about economic growth prospects? Last point, I think that the hard pr problem you put up that is not addressed is the demographics and the graying population and the unfunded liabilities of retirement systems, which are a, a looming catastrophe. But going to economic growth, it seems to me you didn't make the case that extent of the market was what the, the primary driver for economic growth throughout the last hundred years or even the post-war period. Thank you. Um, two things I, I have in mind. One is that I don't, I don't think it's an economic argument. It's more geopolitical and my, my, one of my best colleagues at the university understands all these things, I do not know anything about it, he always talks about, talks about the shifts of the global economy somewhere to the east, north or whatever. Uh, so, um, he always speaks about Chinese growth as, uh, as, a, as a squeezed growth we saw in the west before. Meaning that it took United States seven generations what we saw in one generation in China, but even if you recalculate the growth, it was uh, not even comparable, so, so that's why we saw all these two-digit growth, even with all the reservations we have to, uh, to the way how they, how they measure it. So, um, I don't know if it's innovation, or if it's catching up with something we already had in the West, an exchange of the ideas. We already innovated during the times of open markets and extensive growth and high population growth in the West. And then the East or South catched up. Uh, this would be his argument and I, uh, and I, I think that uh, it can explain a lot and it still is dependent on the population. And the second is that if you look at the standard macroeconomic models, like as I mentioned the solar model, then it's pretty hard to model innovation uh, independently on the population growth. Uh, that innovation usually is uh, is dependent on on the, on the population growth and most of the models at big that, what is it, 1956, the solo model started with the with the assumption that the population growth is positive. It explodes with negative growth in, in, in many of the versions of the model and some of the authors, as one of the, one of, uh, I mentioned, they know that it's a very simplified model, but with the population growth, you have even the problem with the innovation. You keep the knowledge you already have, even there you have a problem, maybe we can lose some knowledge. It happened to some civilizations before, so with less people, we may not be possible, able to keep the knowledge we already have. This is one of the arguments, but you're, you're, it's much harder to generate more knowledge with less people. That the Julian Simons arguments, that there are other offers who, who, who made the argument that more people we have, the better for the innovation. So, it only adds to my pessimism, 
But, but I understand I understand the question that uh, it may be not only like simply stating that the more people, the more trade, but using the words of Julian Simon, that's the ultimate resource. And if the ultimate resource is, de is decreasing, I would be worried. Okay, so the most important thing I'm taking away from this evening is that Thanos from MCU was wrong. <laughs> by and half of the people. And fortunately, we live in a world where Thanos doesn't exist and the infinite is no meter. But in the same way um, as Thanos was thinking, we are facing some people who are sharing the same ideas. You know, people arguing for decrease of population, arguing for the future of Etc. Et and you know they are basically thrown in the exact opposite of what you think is the correct way forward. How would you address those people, and how would you convince the population to uh, the society to increase have more children, and not the opposite? Uh, I wouldn't try to convince anyone to have more children. More children. Uh, so even even myself, we have two, and we stop there. So. Even I'm not above the, the magical number. Uh, the second thing is that um, it happens to me, and I think to all of us here, that, that people have different ideas than we do. So it's, it's not, that, not, not that uncommon. And especially with the degrowth movement, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't even understand it. Uh, so uh, I don't, maybe <laughs> if they would see what's going on with the population, we would not have any problem with like, limiting the population as they fought a few decades ago. Now we are naturally, I guess, we are heading to, 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 to less people in the world, so maybe it's more environmentally friendly. I don't know, I have questions here you know, regarding the, the, the innovation, that more people means more innovative idea how to handle problems we have with the environment. So I don't think that less people is ultimately better. Maybe, uh, maybe not. So this outcome is something they probably would like, no? Uh, I have more problem with the conspiracy theorists who say that there is some huge global agenda which tries to decrease the population because for some reason, I don't know what the reason is, no one ever told me, the less people we will have on the planet, the better for the readers, or something like that, which I don't understand. So there, I do not know how to argue, but with with the degrowth, this is exactly what they want you now, to have less people and slower growth because of having uh, less people on the planet. And it's happening naturally for them. Maybe we will replace it with robots and everything will be fine. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, what happened with the artificial intelligence in a few past months, anything can happen in the future. And it's pretty hard to predict anything in, in, in for 2100. And so uh, I have a lot of reservations to that. But one thing is clear, the estimates by the United Nations are overestimated. That's something I would bet everything I have on, because we already see a lot of numbers lower than where in the model before. So probably the other peak will be somewhere uh, between 8 and 9 and And we don't know if Thanos is real or not because we will, not, never, we will never have that many people to convert the galaxies and find them. In the Marvel Universe we have and colonized the galaxies, but unfortunately that will never happen. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation, a lot of thoughts. <laughs> really nice. So I want to make the case for technological innovation. Okay, uh, you were mentioning Julian Simon, and I, I agree with Tom that uh, you know um, economic growth was based on the division of labor, but the division of labor on the last is the division of the knowledge storage. Okay, because until now the only way that human knew about knowledge storage is the human brain. But maybe not from now, okay? Maybe there will be some technological innovation that will help humanity to 
storage the knowledge, the collective knowledge, I mean, okay? And this collective knowledge is not needed to be storage in the brain anymore of humans, okay? So maybe this will help to solve part of the problem. Because the gentleman over there was asking if the reducing the mortality rate could solve the problem, not at all. Okay, we came from Spain. We have the second highest um, uh, life expectancy in the world. Only Japan is ahead of us. I think we have a life expectancy of uh, 84 years, or 84 point something. Okay, and now we have 11 million of people living on pension, 11 million. Three million people working for public, for the government, which is living on pension, actually. And then three million of unemployment, they are living on pension. Okay, so we have 16 million people living on pension in Spain and 10 million people working. So this is unsustainable. Okay, so the median wage, the median salary of the pension is higher than the median salary of the people working. And additionally, they get everything for free. So this is unsustainable. So this, this, this won't solve the problem at all. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm optimistic about the future, and I think that we'll be able to manage it. That again, uh, I truly believe so, but it's harder than simply have a large population, yeah. and this is why I called it the low hanging fruit. It's pretty easy. Like you have a billion of people in China, just like open the borders, open markets, and uh, suddenly you you have growth. Uh, it's very easy, uh, but. I don't think that we already exploited all of these uh, low-hanging fruits or uh, draw upon these uh, these um, simple types of growth. But in the future, we'll manage very technical domestic. Uh, so I believe so, uh, but it's harder. That's that's my that's that's my point. And probably Spain is a good a good idea to mention because that's quite the opposite of what we have here in this republic. Here, most of the people work. And in, in Spain, I remember as a student at the high school, I I wanted to I want I want to know some empirics about why to enroll at a university. So I find uh, found the statistics of how uh, how higher is the, the the average wage of a university degree graduate and, and the high uh, and the high school graduate. And all of the countries had some differences, but in Spain it was reversed. So if you study university, it was lower, the, the average weight was lower than as, as a high school graduate. And I, I remember looking at it and said, what's, what's wrong with Spain? Uh, and there's a lot of things wrong in Spain, that's, uh, that's true. So I, uh, I understand that, especially in Spain, it may be a problem. Not that much here yet, but on the other hand, because you don't have to work that much, you have the high like life expectancy, nice weather, everything's fine, no troubles. Um, uh, probably in the future we'll see that all over the world, uh, and I think we're uh, we're getting there. So you get the pension. Yeah, because everyone everyone will be Spain in the future, just ahead ahead of us. Actually, in Spain we work a lot. We work. I mean, in the European Union, we are the, the ones that spend more hours working. The productivity—it's another thing. We are the ones that we spend a lot of hours in the offices. Um, I would like to uh, address a little bit the, the issue, the challenge uh, of the pension system, and I think that we, as liberal libertarians or free-market people, as we like to call it. Uh, we should be pushing in all our societies, and I think here in the Czech Republic it happens the same like in Spain, you have a pay as go system. So it's unsustainable. And this uh, fuels populistic uh, speeches. Because we have an aging population that looks for the state to ensure the pension and to give them free stuff and maintain them because afterwards they, they worked a lot and they paid a lot through taxes. So an, uh, an important approach to our problem should be to be pushing but very actively to move as soon as possible towards a capitalized system of pension. 
We can call it uh, individualized saving so that uh, normal population don't be scared about maybe capitalism and so on. But we should be uh, actually taking very seriously towards a transition, transition in all our countries. It's, it's the only sustainable thing for the pensioners. And thank you for mentioning it. There is one problem, one problem I have with that. If we, if we would have the free market choice that I would invest all of my money I now have to pay the government to insure myself against the old age, as they call it. So if I would put this, all of this money into United States capital markets, I would be pretty okay with that. The problem is that whenever in our region someone says that we should move from the pay as you go to some fund system, by that they mean some government sponsored or managed fund system, and that's a problem. And between these two, I would rather have the pay as you go system because, and we saw it in Hungary, we saw it a little bit in Poland, that once you have the fund, uh, in the basic system, there is nothing to steal. But once you have the fund with a lot of money people save there, the politicians always, in any crisis, have a tendency to borrow there a little bit from the fund. So if it would be that I buy, I bought, I buy share, shares in the United States, capital markets, that's, that's fine for me. But I don't think that anyone would allow that because they would always say, we need to somehow guarantee that it will not fall, it will not fail. The, Capital markets are so uh, so volatile that you would never know what happens. So we would somehow guarantee this would be a state fund system which would invest in the capital markets. But once you have the money here to take from, uh, it's not it's not a hypothesis. It happened in Hungary. Once you have that much money to to look at, the politicians will always always take it. So pragmatically. Basic ecosystem is good that there is nothing to steal. But I understand, in the ideal world, I would rather have the money to, to invest individually. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, we are not talking about the ideal world. We are talking about the models that already exist and are already working in some of the countries. Uh, we can, for instance, take the model of Norwegian government, for instance. You have the Norwegian fund that uh, ensures, warranties the, that the pension system, the capitalized part of the pension system, is not going to be in the hands of the politicians, whichever color of their ideology. Uh, you can, for instance, of course, we can reform constitutions, but the constitutions also can be reformed by by populists and uh, authoritarians, but there are already things that we can do in order to keep the politicians out of the, the, of the system. So this, I, I only suggest that we should take uh, serious consideration because this is actually the only uh, very strong tool that we can have from the free market perspective and that is already working in some places and we can use as examples. It is, but I still have to bother here because I think that it's um, it's not that likely to have a system which survives for such a long period of time, like like the Chilean pension system. Uh, I mean, it's surprising. As in theory, I wouldn't expect that it would survive for such a long time and then be transformed or steal from. Uh, we don't have oil as the Norway has for the Nor Norwegian fund, but we, we have some other resources we, we could use. So definitely, uh, I understand this is something, once you have that high amount of people living on the pensions, this is something we, we, we have to look at. But I just don't think that in the political reality there is a magical silver bullet solution which which would work, unfortunately. And I want, wanted to stress that even the the system I hate, the basic system, which we all know is is a pyramid scheme, has one benefit that there is nothing to steal from, which which is good. As in our context, I'm glad that they have nothing to steal from. Okay, so I think that's the end of the former part of the event.
Uh, I would like to thank Dominic very much for the talk. Uh, when, I, uh, when I joined the Liberal Institute and I took over some parts of what Dominic was doing, I remember one note of, of Dominic's that he always gave out to the speakers at the Liberal Institute Summer Academy was that they should always come on stage with a beer in their hand to show the right posture for the event. So this is what I'm doing right now as well. And this is because now we are slowly moving to the informal part of the event. The cafe is open until the midnight and we have the space reserved not only here but also uh, in the other room. So feel free to stay and network. Uh, but before we move on to that part and before we, before we go on to, to rest before tomorrow, if you are joining for the Abbas Network Liberty Forum tomorrow, I would like to welcome one more special guest on stage to say a few words about Students for Liberty and what we are all doing here, which is Alexander McCobbin, uh, the founder of Students for Liberty. So from the Czech founder, we are now moving on to the international founder, and I'm excited, very excited that we have him here today, and I hope you welcome him in the class. Anything. I wasn't planning on talking. I just wanted to show up to see what Students for Liberty in the Czech Republic was like. And I have to say, at the first Students for Liberty conference in 2008, we didn't have many more people at that conference than is in this room right now. One other person in this room was there with me, Tom Palmer, remembers it. And at the time, we thought that was, and it might have been, one of the largest gatherings of libertarian students in the world up to that point. And to see Groups like this around the globe now spreading the ideas of individual liberty, free markets and free minds is just absolutely incredible. And all I can say is thank you for carrying on this work and inspiring me to carry on the fight in a different stage in my life now. And how excited I am to see all of you here. Really, thank you. I just say one final note that even now Alex is uh, making sure that students for the staff and volunteers are uh, good at what they do is right now several students of ours are involved in the seminar that this current organization meet is organizing. So I'm very thankful for that. And I'm very thankful for all of you that showed up today. And I think that's it. Uh, one one more. To Dominic, thank you. <laughs> Thank you again for coming.